Foundation and to uh, Bay Area for the wonderful hospitality. I want to start off with two quotes. The first is from Genesis. Then Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and began to call upon the name of the Lord, El Olam. And Abraham dwelt many days among the Philistines. The second quote from Levinas. To do phenomenology is not only to safeguard the significance of language, it is to research the human or interhuman plot as the fabric of the ultimate intelligibility. It's a great pleasure to be here in Beersheba, the place where Abraham began to call upon the name of the Lord, which is, by the way, perhaps the signature verse of the great uh, Jewish thinker Maimonides, who emblazoned it on the frontispiece of his Guide of the Perplexed. Uh, and that's significant for our purposes here today, because in the short time available this afternoon, I want to argue that Levinas gives us a way to renew Jewish philosophical fascination with the figure of Abraham, that doing so is an important window into crucial aspects of Levinas's ethical phenomenology, and that this project can also help us to bring Levinas's own philosophical writing into more fruitful conversation than has sometimes been the case with the richness of classical Jewish thought. I also have another ulterior motive. Uh, in addition to being a scholar of Jewish studies and religion, like many of the people here, uh, I'm also a social anthropologist who's been wrestling for a long time now with the intuition that Levinas's ethical phenomenology holds a key to understanding what anthropologists do, which is frequently to rely upon the hospitality of strangers and to transform that ethical situation into a, content, into a context for the generation of knowledge. My paper this morning, which I view, or this afternoon, which I view as an opportunity for conversation rather than a finished product, product is a monologue in three parts. I want to explore the resonances between Levinas's Abraham and the Abraham of Maimonides, Midrash, and Kabbalah. Okay, part one, Maimonides. And sorry, Professor Kriesel is not here. You can tell him that I did Levinas facing Maimonides. Um, it's no accident that Maimonides begins his philosophical magnum opus, The Guide of the Perplexed, by invoking the name of Abraham, who called upon the name of the Lord here in Beersheba. For Maimonides, Abraham is the epitome of the natural philosopher, whose reflections upon the phenomenal world lead him to reject all forms of idolatry and then proclaim that rejection to the entire civilized world, even at great personal cost. There's reason to think that Maimonides himself identifies greatly with this Abraham. Before he becomes a prophet, Maimonides Abraham is the child of three who traces chains of cause and effect back to the unmoved mover of Aristotle in a process that will be recommended later to every believer who seeks to attain the love and fear of God through contemplation of the natural world. The apparent contradiction between this Aristotelian framework and the spirit of Levinas's otherwise than being has prevented, in my view, an adequate treatment of Levinas's indebtedness to Maimonides. But I want to call attention to just two aspects of Maimonides' Abraham through which I think direct lines to Levinas uh, can be drawn. One is the absolute incommensurability, Maimonides posits, between God and all forms of being expressible, expressible in human language up to and including the language of presence or being itself, which we'll come back to. The other, perhaps more subtle issue, is the way in which the properly philosophical project of knowing God, according to Maimonides, finally gives way to an ethical revelation, which I have referred to elsewhere as the collapse of ontology into ethics. To take the problem of language first, uh, nearly the whole part of the first God, the, the whole of the first part of the Guide of the Perplexed is obviously devoted to establishing the incommensurability of the divine with human language and conceptual structures, despite the apparent necessity of the Torah speaking in human language. This is true not just of obviously anthropomorphical uh, language, like the possession of divine hands or feet, but extends also to emotional language, like the love of God, God's love for human beings, compassion, and ultimately in the crescendo of Guide 156 and 63, to the assertion that even being itself cannot properly be predicated of the divine. Divine existence cannot be said, Maimonides tells us in chapter 56, to be simply a more stable, eternal form of human existence, but as something wholly incommensurate with it. Saying that God exists is no different in principle from saying that God has hands or feet. It's hard to believe that this would have been lost on Levinas, who read and taught sections of the guide early in his career, and is known to have focused on uh, chapters 113 and 27. But it turns out that there's also a much more direct reverberation, and it's most apparent in Maimonides' treatment of the divine glory, Kvod Hashem, uh, which is also a favorite Levinasian theme. 
The single most frequently referenced biblical episode in the guide is the so-called Theophany of Exodus 33 and 34. Fresh from the debacle of the golden calf, Maimonides apparently asks to see God's kavod and is refused. Man cannot see God and live. Instead, Moses is granted a view of God's back, along with the revelation of what the rabbis would later call the 13 principles of mercy, rachum, v'chanun, er, and so forth. The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious. In his Talmudic essays, uh, Levinas references the rabbinic midrash on this passage, which says that God showed Moses the knot, kesher tilt, shel tefillin, the knot on the back of the tefillin. And Levinas exclaims, even here, a prescriptive teaching. The point is that there is no theophany, uh, according to Levinas. What there is is the revelation of an obligation. And it's the obligation that the rabbis of Levinas after him focus, focus on, and not anything really having to do with the image of the divine or the presence of the divine, uh, etc. Now, as I've outlined at length elsewhere, Maimonides also stands out among medieval commentaries for a very simple reason. Unlike any of the Judeo-Arabic philosophers who preceded him, and unlike any of the Kabbalists who came after, Maimonides insists time and again in his reading of this passage, from the first chapter of the Mishneh Torah and on throughout the guide, that Moses' request, Hareini nat vodecha, show me please your glory, was not in fact a request to see anything. Uh, not a created light, as Sajet and Huda and Yehuda HaLevi suggest, uh, and not a lower reach of the divinity, as Ra'avad, Nachmanides, and later Kabbalists insist, uh, often in great and vigorous opposition, specifically to Maimonides. For Maimonides, Moses was already an accomplished philosopher who had traveled as far down the Via Negativa as unaided human intellect could take him. Uh, before he said, Hareni nak vodecha, he had already come to understand the incommensurability of the divine uh, with the human, uh, which means that Moses was actually asking God to help him attain an even more precise understanding of divine incommensurability, as Maimonides says in Yisodea Torah, like a person who can distinguish other people by their face, and there's no way that he could confuse this person with that person, so uh, Moses wanted to understand the difference between God and all other existence uh, with the same degree of clarity. Here and elsewhere, it's important to note that for Maimonides, as for Levinas, the face, which is an apparently anthropomorphic image of scripture, actually stands for absolute divine incommensurability. Right? To, to know God as clearly as one knows a person by their face is not to know God, but to know precisely how God is ultimately different from anything else that can be said to exist. The face stands as a cipher for absolute otherness, uh, which, as Maimonides says, is not related to what human beings mean by that term. Maimonides consistently invokes this episode, sometimes just through a few words or half a verse in the guide of the Mishnah Torah, every place that he wants to signal the limits of human apprehension at the end of philosophy. Or perhaps more correctly, the ends of philosophy in which negative theology which has purified the God concept of essential attributes up to and including the attribute of being, passes over instead to the knowledge of moral attributes or attributes of action, whose very cognition is experienced, according to Maimonides, as an obligation to emulate divine ways. Just as he is called merciful, Maimonides chooses a version of the Midrash that doesn't attribute characteristics to God. God is only called merciful, but so you should be merciful. Imitatio Dei, which Maimonides identifies at the end of the guide with the very height of human perfection, emerges when philosophy has already done its job, precisely by ridding God of anthropomorphical uh, human attributes. Yet modern Judaism, which has been influenced on so many ways by Maimonides, remains insensate to his teaching on this specific point. The new JPS translation of the Hebrew Scriptures translates kavod everywhere it appears as divine presence, which makes sense for Sadia and Ibn Ezra, among others, but certainly not for Maimonides, who thinks that kavod represents precisely the inability to think about God as presence in these terms. Buber does the same in his biblical interpretation, and Heschel, the great poet of divine presence, takes Maimonides specifically to task on this score, insisting that the kavod is a presence and not a conceptual essence. But what about Levinas? In the academic year 1975 to 76, Levinas lectured at the Sorbonne on uh, God and Anto theology premised on the question, his words, can we think about God outside of ontotheology, outside of God's reference to being? For Heidegger, he writes, the comprehension of being and its truth was immediately covered over by its function as the universal foundation of beings, by a supreme being, a founder, by God. 
The thinking of being becomes knowledge or comprehension of God. The European thinking of being becomes theology. Thinking of being, which Levinas elsewhere associates with both theodicy and insomnia, the endless self-referentiality of, quote, my own adventure and suffering, is here rejected as hopelessly complicit both with the atrocities of the 20th century and with the more general tendency Levinas ascribes to Western thought to privilege being over the fate of individual beings. Over the course of a year's lectures, Levinas experiments with language to speak about God outside of being's register, and he returns multiple times to the language of glory, always closely juxtaposed with the theme of infinity. Quote, the infinity has glory, he writes, only through the approach of the other, through my substitution for the other, or through my expiation for the other. I believe it can be shown that Levinas uses the term glory in its specific biblical register of kavod, and that like Maimonides, he invokes this theme when he wishes to signal that the God he has in mind is beyond or otherwise than being, um, but can only be described through an ethical relation. Quote, the glory, he says, is glorified by the subject stepping out of the dark corners of his reserve, which resembles the thickets where Adam hid upon hearing the voice of the Eternal. The glory of the infinite is expressed in the sincerity of making a sign for the other for whom I am responsible. This manner of being driven out from hiding, this here I am, is a saying whose said consists in saying, here I am, he named it. This is a witnessing of the glory. The glory, or kavod, is in other words, the moment at which the subject steps out from hiding in the Heideggerian anxiety of being in order to stand for the other, in ethical relation. It's a saying that precedes what can be said, a saying that cannot be expressed better than through the words of Abraham, here I am, but which Levinas here identifies with the glory of the infinite. For one who began with philosophy, it is again the collapse of ontology into ethics. There's one final wrinkle here, which is that Abraham is not, of course, the only biblical character whose here I am, Hineni, resonates through subsequent Jewish religious thought. Moses also says Hineni at the burning bush, but in a way that lends further credence to the general argument I've been making about Levinas' dependence upon, or at very least convergence with, Maimonides on this score. When Moses declares Hineni, here I am, to God at the beginning of his adoption of responsibility for the redemption of the people of Israel, a potent midrash takes him to task for his arrogance. You declare Hineni, God says to, uh, Abra to Moses. Uh, but Abraham already declared Hineni. You say that you're ready to be a king and a priest? But Abraham was already ready to be a king and a priest. Who are you to compare yourself with the pillar of the world, Amundosh Olam? Take your shoes from off your feet, because the ground in which you are standing is holy, is taken by this midrash to mean, uh, be careful when you compare yourself to Abraham, because you may find yourself wanting by comparison. Maimonides certainly is sensitive to this, for he too describes Abraham as Amudosh Olam in the very beginning of Hilchot Avodat Kochavim, where he also comments that Moses' mission of redemption comes only in fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham and the love that God bore to Abraham. Elsewhere in the guide, Maimonides consistently subordinates the mission of Moses to that of Abraham and notes that Moses came to fulfill the law through severity, uh, which Abraham had begun through kindness and mercy. Moses may have been the greatest of prophets, but is the image of Abraham who grounds our notion of human perfection. Levinas identifies the glory of the infinite with Adam being driven out of hiding because that's its most universal enactment. But it is still Abraham uh, whose saying he invokes, quote, to ask oneself whether God cannot be uttered in a reasonable discourse that would be neither ontology nor faith, he writes, and God comes to mind, is implicitly to doubt the formal opposition established by Yehuda Halevi and taken up by Pascal between the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, which invoked without philosophy, and the God of the philosopher. For Maimonides, of course, the God of Abraham and philosophy are one. Part two, Midrash. My point in these remarks is certainly not to transform Levinas into a Jewish philosopher after the Maimonidean model, or into a professional interpreter of Midrashim. Rather, I want to be clear that I'm reading Levinas the way Jeffrey Kosky does, when he later asserts that Levinas's project is to ground ethics as first philosophy, independent of any claims to revelation or authority of classical Jewish texts, including scripture. But, his, uh, but Levinas's fundamental realization, for which he drew on Jewish sources for inspiration and resources of expression, is that the ethical cannot be grounded primarily in a phenomenology of individual consciousness, which, uh, where it's, uh, which, which is where so many of Husserl's disciples came to rest. Quote, 
the possibility of the infinite will not be found by a phenomenology of consciousness, where all that comes to light does so in the present and as an object adequate to the intention that aims at knowledge of it. Or, to use Levinas' own language, the infinite is a thought destined to think more than it thinks. Rather than a phenomenology of pure consciousness, as in Husserl or Morloponti, or a phenomenology of being like that uh, trailblazed by Heidegger, Levinas seeks a phenomenology of the ethical relation that precedes both content and form of ordinary consciousness, the saying that precedes the said. The fact that there was already a philosophical tradition that juxtaposed knowledge of divine being with knowledge of ethics and privileged the latter in Maimonides must have held a powerful fascination. But in the absence of an Aristotelian framework adequate to modern thought, Levinas takes this resonance of Maimonides and casts it in his own unique language and conceptual form. Unlike Maimonides, for example, Levinas is fascinated, it seems to me, by the midrashic treatment of God as a subject like other subjects with whom one can stand in ethical relation. It's not an accident that it can be difficult to distinguish in Levinas between the other which is God and the other who is the neighbor, and that he seems at times intentionally to blur this distinction. Uh, this has sometimes frustrated theological readers of Levinas who are eager to understand how God, who is sui generis, uh, fits into Levinas' ethical phenomenology. And it has rejoiced some more secularly minded readers who find in Levinas as God who has otherwise been being an opportunity to participate in the resonance and moral seriousness of religious language without in fact being caught up in the metaphysical assertions or conundrums of religion. Some have suggested that God, who appears in Levinas' text, is really just a cipher for the ethical relation after all, the other who stands for all others and need not be thought of in its own terms. This may well be true in the phenomenological sense that Levinas does indeed invoke God in his philosophical writings, not for any sense of traditional authority, but for the idea of infinitude and height that this idea still allows us to express, perhaps uniquely, even in our disenchanted contemporary language. Incidentally, both Levinas and his fellow Latvian Jew Abraham Isaac Cook uh, point to the danger in idolatry uh, precisely in that it reduces human horizons uh, by reducing the height of ethical demand. Divine glory, or kavod, Rabbi Cook remarks, becomes most dangerous when it is concretized from the body like the desire of a human tyrant for honor that knows no limits. Like Maimonides and Rabbi Cook, Levinas references the danger of paganism not principally as a danger that comes from outside, from other religious communities, but as a danger from deep within monotheistic faith itself. The danger, Levinas writes, of a god who cannot escape the confines of the world, the confines of totality. The glory, Levinas writes, is not something added, certainly not an experience of the infinite. There can be no experience of the infinite. This much we know from the Bible, and he says this in the Sorbonne, not in his uh, Jewish writings. Uh, to know God is to do justice to the neighbor. Yet alongside this concern of distancing God from the image of the human, which is also part of traditional Jewish philosophical concern, comes the midrashic treatment of God as neighbor, which is already presupposed by the synthetic comment of Rashi to Shabbat 31a, when Hillel defines the essence of Torah as that which is hateful to you, do not to your neighbor. Uh, Rashi absorbs an entire world of midrashic discourse when he says that the neighbor in this passage refers to the Holy One, blessed be he. Just as you hate when another transgresses your will, so you should obey the will of the Holy One, blessed be he. Here is an interpretation of all Torah in the frame of an ethical relation without in any way reducing Judaism, including its ritual prescriptions to mere ethics in the style of 19th century reform. What is more, the Midrash tends to associate Abraham, whom God refers to in scripture as Avraham Ohavi, Abraham my friend, with this mode of relation more than any other biblical character, more than Moses, more than Jacob, more than anybody. The famous Midrash that describes how Abraham encountered God for the first time, Birachat Doleket, a castle on fire, uh, within which, from within which the householder calls out, don't think there's nobody home, here I am. He doesn't use the term here I am. Uh, puts Abraham precisely in the position of taking infinite responsibility for God himself. Like a servant, says one 19th century reading, who must use a torch to rescue the king from a dark place. The juxtaposition, or transubstantiation, if you will, between God and neighbor in Levinas' writing is sometimes seized upon as evidence of discomfort with traditional categories. But without presuming to say anything about Levinas' own religious expression, of which he was so reticent to speak, it can certainly be said that this theme carries within it deep roots in Jewish sacred writing. It is a theme in which the ethical relation, Abraham's decision to stop and help the owner of the castle, precedes revelation, contributing at least a structure, if not a specific content, to Levinas' uh, 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 later insistence 
on the priority of the saying to the said. Jewish sources do not, in other words, influence Levinas through any claim to special authority, but through a deep structure of thought that resonates with his own reflections on the phenomenology of ethics. To answer the challenge posed by Robert Gibbs, it's not so much that the infinite precedes the ethical relation, uh, but that both are realized simultaneously in my relation with the neighbor, who is always close, yet always tantalizingly unapproachable. Part three, Kabbalah. This brings me to my final section, Kabbalah. Have no fear, I don't intend to turn Levinas into a Kabbalah. Uh, though in his much-cited essay on Rabbi Chaim of Volazhen, he expresses a determination, despite the dis disenchantment of Kabbalistic metaphysics, to hold on to what he calls, quote, the inimitable resources of this language, especially the language of tzimtzum, or divine contraction, which finds its way deep into the structure of totality and infinity and other writings, as a description of the ethical relation. Indeed, Levinas says, uh, as much in the Chaim of Lajan essay, uh, where he identifies the self-contraction necessary for the performance of mitzvot directly with the ethical relation, making space for the other to sustain the world. What has been less well explored is that this ethical reading of Kabbalistic myth also has strong precedent precisely in the Lithuanian Kabbalistic tradition. Uh, Sholem writes that the myth of Tzimtzum was introduced by Lurianic Kabbalah to preserve theism, the idea of God over against creation, from the panentheistic tendencies of predecessors like Moshe Cordovero. In Lithuanian Kabbalah, both Hasidic and non-Hasidic, this process takes on a distinctively ethical coloration. Rabbi Sholem Dovber of Lubavitch and his son, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak, both write about Simtsum uh, as the, uh, at the very end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th as the human psychological principle of making room for the other person, or as they would say, the other Jew, uh, which Levinas, whether or not he was ever aware of their writing, takes in a far more universalistic direction. Both Lithuanian Hasidism and their opponents, students of the Gaon of Vilna, also insisted that this Simtsum cannot be understood literally uh, with respect to space, but must be understood as mashal umlitsa. Uh, where I think Levinas takes this further, this de really deserves greater elaboration, is that for Levinas, even the mashal umlitsa is a mashal umlitsa for something else beyond that. And that's something that we really need to talk about. Levinas wants to use this language without any metaphysical presumptions, and that begs the question what exactly he's trying to say. Rav Kook, meanwhile, uh, follows his teacher in Kabbalah, the Lesha, uh, in insisting that following Tzimtzum, God can only be approached through the ethical Midot without falling into the trap of what he calls Avak Avodah Zarah, right? the, the dust of the sin of idolatry. So without reducing Levinas in any way to these sources, it's important to understand that there's a broader intellectual context in which many of his formative ideas find precedence, or at least convergence. And one of the great problems in Levinas scholarship is, of course, we don't know what his Jewish library looked like. We don't know exactly what he was reading, what he learned from his teacher Shoshani. He, he writes about his early childhood education, the Bible, and Dostoevsky. Uh, he writes occasionally about a, an essay like the one of uh, Behind the Volozhin. Uh, but we don't know, frankly, well enough what Levinas was reading and what he was thinking about in terms of his broader, his broader Jewish knowledge. Now, where does this all leave me? Where? Hmm? Where? Uh, we'll see. Where does this all mean? As a scholar of Jewish thought and comparative religion, it should be enough for me to have laid out some uh, connections or convergences that enrich our understanding of the soil from which Levinas grows, alongside other influences, Rosenzweig, Buber, Husserl, and Heidegger. However, as an anthropologist, I also want to understand Levinas's task on another level. But like him, I'm looking for intellectual resources to examine the ethical relation, the saying that precedes the said, which can be identified with culture where social science is presumed to begin. But what Levinas gives me in this sense is not a content, but an optics, as in his saying that ethics is an optics. Um, he helps to call attention to certain moments in the interhuman relation or in intersubjectivity uh, that otherwise get missed. They're not talked about uh, in social science, not talked about very much in philosophy either, because it's not clear how to describe them. When I see somebody reaching out to another person, how do I distinguish the kind of self-referential concern with, let's say, uh, my spiritual welfare, giving charity so that I can enjoy the next world. How do I differentiate that as an observer from the kind of uh, selfless self-contraction that Levinas talks about as the, the moment of ethical relation? And this is a serious problem for which there's no easy answer. But at the very least, Levinas gives us a conceptual language to begin to even describe these things, 
which so far have not been described, as far as I can tell, any place in the social scientific literature. Uh, we need to describe these moments of interpersonal transcendence that are not primarily or only interpretable through the unfolding of cultural meaning that correspond to what Weber called theodicy and what Geertz calls uh, symbolic culture. To what may this matter be compared? Uh, to Abraham, who after having undertaken the painful burden of circumcision, is portrayed resting and recuperating in the terebinths of Mamre, when God appeared to him. Immediately, the text tells us that three strangers appeared in the desert and that Abraham went to greet them and give welcome, to welcome them into his home. But the text tells us nothing more about God's appearance to Abraham. There seems to be a break in the text. Two readings of this story with which I'll conclude. The Baal Shem Tov, founder of Hasidism, writes that the appearance of three travelers weary in the desert was, in fact, the revelation of God, since God appears in the face of the other who's welcomed into our home. But the Lithuanian Mitnage, Rabbi Naftit Tzvi Yehuda of Berlin, the Nitziv, takes a different tack. According to him, Abraham was communing with God in prayer and contemplation. But when the opportunity to welcome a guest presented itself, Abraham understood that the duty to care for the neighbor, to perform a mitzvah, absolutely transcends my own spiritual adventure with the divine. Abraham had to put God aside in order to greet the wayfarers. <coughs> Traces of both of these approaches can be found in the writings of Emmanuel Levin. God is in the face of the stranger, yet the stranger may take precedence over God. Levinas never chooses clearly between these options, or once and for all. And this precisely remains the dilemma of the scholar who seeks to speak both Hebrew and Greek, of how to determine whether uh, the absence of God is in fact a finding of God, or whether, like the idea of Tzimtzum Kipshuto, which was a great debate within Lithuanian uh, Jewish circles, there really is a space absence of God uh, in which hospitality fills the gap with a kind of human rather than divine substance. Um, my point this morning is not to derive uh, definite conclusions to these questions, but really to begin what I hope will be a generative conversation, maybe with some people here, and to outline some areas that I can intend to continue my research uh, further with. I think that the figure of Abraham is so important for Levinas because the rabbinic tradition reads Abraham precisely as the cipher for hospitality, for the face, for the welcoming of the other, which becomes such important themes uh, in his own writing. Uh, I remember when I used to conduct field work in the Ethiopian community in Israel, uh, I learned a traditional Amharic uh, blessing, which you say upon leaving the home of someone who has shown you hospitality. Betachun ki Avraham beit Yehona, which means May your house become like Abraham's house. Thank you. Good afternoon.